Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about leading remote teams, online collaboration and working in distributed organizations. This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office optional approach. Find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com and check out our show notes and pictures of our lovely guests over on the podcast page. It's great to have you here, listeners. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 260 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast. I remembered that this time, Maya. (laughs) <laughs> what what show is this? Uh, hello, it's the listeners. first show of the new year, so we can call it what we like. <laughs> it's the f- it's the first recording, which is I'm yes. like, oh, which show are we we doing? So, listeners, if you are new to the show, don't worry, we uh, we will we will get on with it. Regular listeners, I hope you forgive us. Um, yes, happy new year. We already said happy new year in the previous episode, but this is a real. We are now in the new year, 2021. My name is Pilar Orti and with me is Maya Middlemiss. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. And happy New Year, everybody. This is our first time recording together, so it does feel like a sort of reboot and a reload for 2021. Definitely. So we've got, a, as always, a what's going on episode with different things. We were saying that we don't have that many different articles because nothing's caught our eye very much yet. However, there's a few things that are happening that are quite good illustrations of how people are working or some of the things that we might need to be considering when working in a remote team, what what the development in tech says about the space. So we hope it'll be interesting, maybe even practical. <laughs> Not sure we want to go there with the What's Going On episode. Um, yes. So any any articles that have caught your eye, we would love to have a look. Virtualnotdistant.com is uh, the place for our contact form but hey let's uh, let's let's kick off what's going on what's going on what's going, what's going on, on? And we'll start with something, Maya, that came through LinkedIn. And it was, I think this is a great one to kick off the episode. It was actually somebody on LinkedIn who got in touch. And well, I'm just going to read it so that you can see uh, listeners. (laughs) So uh, his name is Francisco Corzo. And he wrote, and I've got, obviously, I've got permission uh, from him to read this out and hopefully he can come on the show and tell us more about it. He said, I've been promoting remote working in my country, Guatemala, since late 2019. As we all know, the pandemic has forced most countries and companies to go remote, at least as an emergency response. We've all had interesting learnings. The most valuable gain is the breaking of the paradigm that many old school leaders had around working systems and the wrong belief that they had to have everyone at the office in order to keep companies performing. Now we know that many jobs and roles can have the same or even better performance while remote, at least part time. But what we found in our country is that not everyone has the proper settings at home or can have them. We have a very young population with kids at home. We have larger families and multifamily homes, couples uh, living with uh, parents or having siblings with them, etc., and very small and underdeveloped houses. We're not proud of saying this, but we have a large mid-low to low working class and it shows in their homes. As part of my work with clients, companies, I've put together a survey tool that includes a photo option for the people to send us an image of their working space at home. And it has helped us to show the executives some unsustainable conditions. These people are facing the dilemma of, I feel relieved not to commute for up to three to four hours a day, being exposed to a poor public transportation service and or traffic jams, but... I'm feeling trapped in a very small room in a noisy and stressing environment. And then he continues, I'm trying to encourage and promote the concept of satellite or decentralized offices, bringing office spaces closer to suburbs. And then he asked, 
Do you have any experience in doing this? Companies that have adopted this strategy, companies that offer these services, etc. I would be grateful to learn from your experience and knowledge and any learnings you could share. Listeners, one of the reasons why uh, this is in this episode is also, well, I think it's fascinating a uh, story, um, but also if you can uh, provide Francisco with any examples or even any thoughts at this stage, I think, or uh, around especially this concept of the, where was it, uh, the satellite or decentralized offices, bringing office spaces closer to suburbs, then get in touch, Pilar, P-I-L-A-R, at virtualnotdistant.com if you fire an email out. Maya, this was such a gem of a message to get through LinkedIn. Wasn't it amazing? And doesn't it make you think about what we take for granted um, and really the definition of the phrase first world problems when we, you know, we were talking just before we were recording about what monitor size to buy and things like that. And, you know, just trying to imagine people trying to work from home in the conditions that he's describing. Um, it really puts everything into perspective, I think, what we take for granted. Yeah, and I think it's such a powerful thing to be doing to say to senior leaders or CEOs, hey, these are the conditions. If you want mm. to continue to offer remote work or if you've had to let go of your office and want people to continue working from home, you've got to sort this out. Yeah, this is what people are up against. We can't really imagine what it's like. And I'm sure that in the environment he's talking about, there is an even greater spectrum of difference socioeconomically between the leaders and the people doing the most junior roles. So I love the idea that he's getting them to to share photographs and really bring that home to people who probably can't imagine what it's like to be living, never mind working, in conditions that they, they may never have experienced or long since left behind. And I think it's really important. One of the reasons I want to talk to him is actually that Maybe that's the norm in Guatemala, but definitely in the UK, I can picture this also happening. Maybe not as uh, drastic, but yeah, we know of people hunching over the laptop uh, in their kitchen table. And we know that in organizations, there is a huge salary difference between um, the higher roles and the lower roles. And that will reflect maybe how they're experiencing the working from home thing. So yeah, definitely. I think it's really important, listeners, also, if uh, if you are in a country that's not the UK, not the US, not Spain, uh, that uh, it would be lovely to hear if there's something that's happening there that contrasts to a lot of how we're talking about remote work. It's really nice to hear because I didn't, haven't got a clue what's going on in Guatemala. So listeners, do, do send stuff through as well around that. Uh, and also just this, and the concept, this is, I mean, this is, this is where remote work gets exciting, this concept of satellite offices. So it's not about working in headquarters. It's not about working from home. It's about working from wherever it makes sense. It's really interesting, though, because, you know, we, we think of ourselves as advanced in terms of policy and thinking about trends, whereas this guy in Guatemala has picked up on the need for this, that we, we have to have these spaces. And he's talking about three or four hour a day commutes, Yeah, um, you know, Again, we can't imagine the conditions those are taking place in, but we know that people in London can have easily have a, a one-way journey of over an hour into an office, and it just makes so much sense. All around the world, the high street retail is suffering because of the shift to e-commerce, so there's going to be these spaces which are public buildings, which are in the heart of the local community, and you know, it would be wonderful if, if we do start to see this renaissance of the high street with places that people can come together and work in safe local ways at the heart of where they actually live. So again, listeners, any examples of this, uh, I'll mention uh, Wimble Tech, which is a set of co-working spaces that uh, David Fletcher started, where he basically goes into libraries, finds unused spaces in libraries in London and has turned them into co-working spaces, I think. Just stuff like that. I mean, it's still a co-working space, so it's nothing new. But I think that concept of using the space that's available and that is at the heart of the local community, I think it's uh, wonderful. So great. So thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Listeners, do get in touch with us, Pilar, at virtualnotdistant.com. And if you want to connect with Francisco, uh, we'll, well, <laughs> Maya will stick the link to his LinkedIn in the show notes. So that 
that's like the high level, um, <laughs> the high level piece for today, and definitely for me the the, the most the most interesting. Um, shall we? Where shall we? Go. I think the conversation needs to lead us to tech, Maya. Yeah, get the I've tech got. out yeah. of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Something that happened at the end of uh, 2020 was that the app started to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, no, and we're not talking when Zoom went down for one weekend when it was uh, panic, but um, like Trello and like Google. I couldn't get into my Google Docs. Gmail wasn't working. Panic. It was really scary, wasn't it? It makes you realize that, yes, we've all, this. if 2020 was the year everything shifted to the cloud, we've got to be able to get at the cloud. <laughs> all our stuff is there floating around. Um, <laughs> if we can't access it, it really does paralyze everything. For someone who advocates for visible teamwork, which is essentially done in the cloud, it, mm. it, it really was, a, okay, well, this is just another reminder that we can't rely on one app that we need to have. Um, well, that we need to know that at some point the cl- something might happen to the cloud. And let's hope, I don't want to predict horrible things, but the same way as we've had a pandemic, we could have the internet going down, couldn't we? Well, you know, cyber attacks have increased hugely because unfortunately people are opportunists and they look for vulnerabilities and the fact that more and more people are depending on this stuff makes it a more attractive target for ransomware and everything else. So, you know, whilst it's great to have all these really fluid and available ways of communicating, as Pilar just said, you can't depend on just one of them. You need to have a backup channel and that needs to be clear in your plan. Okay, if for any reason we can't use X, we skip to Y. And also just locally have backups of stuff. Um, you know, your Google Docs need to be synced to your local hard drive so that you can keep working. It's part of your business continuity plan, however and wherever you're working. And we've got to remember that as another lesson from 2020 is that anything can happen. You've got to have a plan. To do item, download Google Docs. <laughs> <laughs> Synchronize for offline working. Mm. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, my default is always, well, not my default, but like, well, the only app that I use uh, on my computer is Scrivener, and that's linked to my Dropbox. But yeah, my mm. Google Docs, I'm always like, it's all always in the cloud. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Tick. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was one. And the other one was, of course, that, uh, I mean, whatever, I don't know how that might, well, this, this movie will um, uh, have some impact on some people and not others, and maybe it won't. But of course, Slack was acquired by Salesforce. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I think we, we do need competition in this space, so it's pretty healthy, I think. it can't Everything can't be dominated by Google and Microsoft and Amazon. But I don't want another big... Uh, <laughs> no, I have to say, though, well, actually, what you say makes a lot of sense because I, it, it's really obvious that the ecosystems that are here to stay are the ones that are integrating everything under one login. So that's why Google and and uh, Microsoft 365 are so strong because it's so convenient. And it's not just that everything is linked there, it's that you have to log in once. Yeah. It's convenient for administrators, it's convenient for users, but it's also convenient for hackers. So yeah. you know, the more you consolidate, the more simple you make it, it, you reduce things to a single point of failure. And just to keep those different huge organizations on their toes. I think it's good that there's a second tier, if you like, things the size of Slack and Salesforce coming along with alternatives to keep everything focused and growing. So, yeah, again, thoughts welcome listeners around all of this. Has, does that affect you? <laughs> does, does this affect you? I think it's, uh, well, let's, let's bring, so this one thing that you might not have been able to have a look at Maya because it's something I added right this morning. I'm not even sure if I've put it here, but I was going to leave it for just a bit later. But actually, um, Basecamp guys who released Hey For You, which is the email system for individuals in 2020, are about to release or maybe have released already Hey For Work. Mm, I heard about that. I haven't read anything about it. So that must be very, very new. I was listening to an episode from Rework, which is their Mm. podcast, uh, from the 8th of December 2020, where the two founders uh, talked about Hey for Work. And one of the things they were talking about was exactly what you're, what you're, well, it's along the lines of what you're talking about, which is email really is dominated by Microsoft and Google. 
uh, and what they've what they're guessing is that anyone who's wanted to come up with anything like email has looked at them how complex and what a what a mammoth beast an email client has become that they've gone ah, <laughs> we're not going there <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, they of course are who they are so uh, they brought out the uh, hey for work and interesting that they're saying well they've created it like they use it so it doesn't have a calendar integrated in it um, because they don't use calendars like companies do in their in their company uh, and the other reason why why I put it in the show notes why I want to talk about they made a really uh, important um, important comment about the use of private emails for personal use. And I think that now that, well, and at the moment, especially uh, during the pandemic, we're recording, what is it, the 12th today? 12th of January, 2021. Um, there's so much uh, home and uh, off <laughs> company spaces blending. And people must remember that their work emails are owned by their company. Uh, the company that has that domain name. So if you want to keep things private, like really private, then make sure you're using personal emails. I think it was a really good reminder. They reminded, and they've tried to do some stuff around that. So it's an interesting episode. It's 8th of December, 2020, Hey for Work, it's called. So yeah, so I just thought I'd bring that in because it, it reminded it's me. It's a really important point because we hear an awful lot about sort of privacy in terms of can Google read our emails and you know, the people that we sign service level agreements with and we get those 27 pages of legalese and skim through and scroll down to hit I agree and then just install the update. Um, but what about, you know, Google aren't that bothered about your private emails, I dare to suggest, but your boss might be. And I think we need to pay a little bit more attention to what we're agreeing in terms of using company servers and corporate owned cloud servers. There's no such thing as really private there. So going from email to another conversation uh, I had with a friend of mine who she's retired, but she was talking about the online meetings that she's been having with friends and how in a group she is just struggling because she's she's, she's always been deaf, uh, but she's uh, obviously been able to to adjust to the uh, co-located space. And actually she used to be a teacher and she was, we were reflecting and she was saying she hadn't realized how much she relied on reading the body and reading the group. She used to teach drama, so that's even more about reading the group and the body because you're not traditionally sitting down like in other subjects. And she hadn't realized how much she really read the body. And we're not talking just crossed, you know, crossed arms or anything. She was saying even someone standing and having their weight shifted to, to one side. <laughs> uh, and she was talking about how much she's struggled with the, with the group uh, meeting. So I just wanted that to be a reminder um, just to when we are continuously meeting online, just to check back in, check in with our, with our people because things change and also things that weren't a problem in the co-located space might be a problem in the online space. Yeah, definitely. I, f I was watching something on the TV news the other day recently and thinking they had the sign language interpreter on there and, and it just suddenly struck me how much they use their whole body. It's not hand gestures by any means. It's really physical. Um, you know, the, the, the signal for Trump is a whole body movement <laughs> that our kids kept repeating. Um, but it's, it's really, if you can't see that entire movement, which you might not be able to easily on a Zoom call that's focused in on faces. It also made me think of how to use the space differently. So the online space. And one thing I've been doing with uh, when I've been attending meetings or uh, meetings with a lot of people or workshops is uh, I'm trying to use space in a way. So I've got my laptop with my camera because it's a, it's a very nice camera in the laptop to one side at an angle. And then I've got the big monitor in front of me. So if somebody is presenting something or talking, I'll probably be looking at them on my monitor. So I'll have my profile to them. When they say something and I particularly want to acknowledge that I agree or that it's funny or whatever, something, I can then turn around and look at the camera and make that gesture. And I think, I mean, I haven't really run whether this is of any use to anyone, <laughs> but it's just something that, again, in conversations, I'm thinking that is, that's something that I've, I've adopted because we don't have that in a 2D online meeting space. We don't have that sense of turning. Yeah. It's about that kind of presence and acknowledgement 
where your attention's going in that moment. So that really amplifies one bit of the conversation or the speech by directing that attention. Again, yeah, it's moving into that third dimension because we don't have that on the screen unless we, like everything else in the remote space, unless we really find a way to make it intentional. And I think also because I miss that. I, I miss the, because if not, we're not, we're not, we're always looking. Yes. <laughs> we're looking and the same direction. How we, weird. If we're sitting around a boardroom table or, a, you know, having a meal or a drink with somebody, we don't just stare at them all the time. It's, yeah. it's weird. So again, play with that. I think that now is the time to experiment. I mean, it's not like uh, this is the first time I've been doing an online meeting, but I think because we're having so many more and they're so different and with so many different people, that which wasn't the case before the pandemic. It was much more reduced, much more the same kind of people, etc. So it's really um, playing and allowing. And, and also, uh, we'll go into this in a second, but someone shared on, on LinkedIn also, that they've started to decide that some meetings, some team meetings are audio only because of the nature of the meeting. So again, don't always make the meetings that have to be exactly the same. Play, the, the technology is there to enable you to have the best experience possible. And maybe it's not what you want because what you want is to be together in the same room, but there's still some tweaking that you can do with the tech, with how you use the tech and how you turn up with the tech. Um so this led me to, um, there was a, a, one of these uh, blog posts that Microsoft puts up and I saw that they have live captions for one-to-one -one calls in Microsoft Teams now, which, you know, some people will, will definitely will welcome uh, for the reasons we've been saying. Um, but then I, because I was like, I hope all their updates are not about meetings. <laughs> and uh, I saw that now you can, you can customize your presence status in team. You can let let others know when you're available in Teams by managing your presence status, which I didn't realize you could customize it already. So forgive me, Microsoft users, if I'm late to the party. But this goes back to the whole visible teamwork aspect of using that customized message to not only say how available you are, but maybe you can share something about yourself or about what you're doing for um in your team, and of course, I understand that when you're in Microsoft, it's the whole organization, but still there's room for playing with that. Yeah, and you could use that in quite a, a systematic business-like way, or you could use it in a more fun, informal way. Exactly. Um, but it's just a really kind of brief, almost like changing your emoji or your mood for your face for the day or something. Yeah. And another thing I really welcome, uh, which uh, I didn't even know you couldn't do this, but of course, yeah, of course, makes sense. Um, is so the other day I was having a conversation with someone and they were saying about you know having Slack open and so it's pinging constantly. And I'm thinking, well, if you don't want it to ping, can't you turn it off? But anyway, in addition to that, let others know when you're not available in Microsoft Teams. You can now change your presence to offline, so you still can work in there. Because remember that um, for those of you who listeners who don't work in Microsoft Teams. That's the hub of the office. From Teams now, you access your documents, you access your planner, you access your shared notes. You can live in Teams now. And I think it's really good to be able to say, I'm not here for you. I'm, I'm working. Yeah. Well, if they want you to work and live in Teams, then they have to give you the equivalent of an office door to close and just say, right, I'm on. Don't disturb me for now. So that's really good that they've done that. And I suppose it, it is more Microsoft eating the world, but they really are trying to provide a completely complete digital workspace so you never have to go anywhere else. Then they have to give you a private room within that. Yeah. So that's really welcome. So again, uh, listeners, whether new or not, actually to remote work, that is the beauty of these tools is that you can turn it, turn them off. <laughs> you can turn off interruptions, uh, make sure you agree that that's okay and that all, all the team members know that that's okay and just make the best out of not being with other people uh, and and don't try to yeah don't don't let what you didn't like in the office interrupt you at home as well so that is so one and uh, i wanted to then let us move into the whole asynchronous conversation Maya, last year we had uh, 2020, we went, okay, yeah, we can meet online. We've all done that. It's better, worse, whatever, but it can be done. And then, of course, everyone went, oh, we don't like remote work. We have to be in online meetings all day. Yeah, um, Zoom fatigue, <laughs> Zoom fatigue, entered the language. <laughs> all of that. And then 
of course, the whole remote community went, hey, async. <laughs> so it's difficult because this is a this is the way that this is what people haven't experienced. So people have experienced meetings and then they have them online, but asynchronous is different. So it's a, it's maybe something that people haven't done. If you are not in a Facebook group or if you've never been in an online forum and used it uh, um, to, to a certain extent, you will not have experienced deep asynchronous communication. So I think we've underestimated this in the online space. And even if people were already doing some sort of that thing with Slack that was working with it, which they had in the office or again, Teams, whatever, the level and how the level of use and how you use it when you're all fully remote is different. So this is something that is uh, new for many people, but that we have a lot of experience in the uh, in the online in the online space, and I really welcomed um, so Management Futures, uh, who are a coaching a company of coaches in uh, based in London. Wonderful stuff. They've been around for ages. Uh, Phil Hayes, one of their founders, was in episode I don't know eight or something like that of this show, um, and they had a twenty twenty what a year, and they said that. Um, Individual teams and organizations have been tested in ways none of us expected. In our final learning lab of the year, we shared nine key trends the uh, Management Futures team have seen during 2020. Well-being, asynchronous is the second one. Uh, I think they're in alphabetical oh, no, they're not in alphabetical order. <laughs> so well-being, asynchronous, autonomy, and they have a, a Quote here saying, the virtual world has opened up a gap between mediocre managers and those who are exceptional. Another person reflected, there's no longer a hiding place for those who can't lead. So it's very harsh. Adaptability and then innovation, diversity, equity and inclusion, inclusive leadership, teaming and coaching. Uh, and coaching is way beyond demand for coaching that they talk about. It's also about adopting uh, coaching. Um, any thoughts on this before I rant on about mine? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was nothing massively surprising in here, but it was a nice summary of, of the trends, not just for 2020, but everything we're taking forward because all of these are, are areas that any leader, any organization needs to have attention on for 2021 and beyond, I think. Mm. So I was very pleased that asynchronous made it there. That was yes. like, okay, it's great. Nice and high up the list yeah, as well. Yeah, okay. yeah. So that's it. If, if So that's good. And also it, we've been seeing it. And then to then something that came up just a day or two ago, and it was shared by Justin Morris, who was here in the show a couple of times talking about actually some stuff around Microsoft Teams. And now he's gone and worked. He's working for Microsoft <laughs> for <laughs> Teams. So I'm delighted to have introduced him to my friend Hugh. And of course, uh, uh, Chris is there. Um, and of course, Marta. So, so lo lots of voices from the show. So this uh, person called uh, Nick Hederman shared on LinkedIn in the articles that used to be Pulse, January 6th, 2021, 2020 remote working reflections. And what he's done, I think is really interesting for listeners to look at regarding of whether the remote work is new for you or not. For a start, it's the way it's been presented. Uh, and they've got two parts to remote teamwork, one of which is synchronous and the other one is asynchronous. They're separate but connected in the graphic. This is brilliant. I wish I'd come up with something like this. Um, and it's it's got things like wor working out loud in there. Uh, and there's a couple of things. My favorite, well, uh, what, what were your, sorry, Maya, what were your, your favorite bits of uh, I of really this like this article, actually. I love the kind of approach that they took that, okay, we're not certain about any of this. We're going to test things out. We're going to experiment. We're going to evaluate that. Um, there were lots of things I really liked. The The way that they have this spectrum of synchronous to asynchronous and clearly identifying opportunities within that, like the opportunity for walking meetings when it's going to be audio only, for example, and encouraging people to get outside and move around a bit. Um, I thought that was lovely. I've never heard that called out in that way before. It's something I really like doing. Um, and often, if you haven't consciously decided in advance, it's going to be an audio only meeting. 
you you can't because you're on the wrong device. And it's that sort of intentionality that says, okay, we're just going to have a call, guys, so you can be doing whatever you want. Um, there was something about cake as well, which I thought was very nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, just the fact that they've really thought about different kinds of meetings, different kind of intentions and expectations from those meetings. So whether it's a case of bring your coffee and cake because it's, it sets the tone for something quite relaxed and flexible, um, whereas other things are much more formal and structured. Um, some things are spontaneous, some things are planned, and they really, really thought the whole ecosystem of ways to collaborate. I, I like you, I really like the graphic, um, and it's it's got a Microsoft logo in the corner of it. Is this something from Microsoft or is well, this something that they've developed? Well, n- no, but Nick Hedeman is the director of Modern Work and Security Business right. Group at Microsoft. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so okay. damn, it's copyright. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I didn't uh, catch on to that because uh, LinkedIn hides is director modern work and secure, and then it's dot dot dot. So I right. couldn't see where he was from, but I, I did look as I thought actually, yeah, the same thing. Why is that? And also, he says something like. Uh, when he's talking about working out loud, he says, one philosophical design point for Microsoft Teams is, so I thought, okay, maybe he's connected. Yes, of course he is. Um, that is, but this is brilliant. And I, I think that uh, it's really nice. What what I like, one of the things I, I do like about Microsoft is that the people are really advocates for their products and they're genuine. Like this comes from, this is not a marketing thing. This is someone going, hey, we've got this product, how great that we sell it and use it and we're using it really well. So here it is. Yeah, and you can learn from that and share it. It's really nice. I, even the things that they learned from that didn't go so well, like he talks about team hygiene and having to cut down the number of channels and things like that, which is something so many organizations go through when the structure that you use has grown organically and, and people keep opening up new channels and folders and things like that. And just to identify that you need somebody needs to go in there with a broom occasionally and just tidy up. Yeah. Someone asked me today, was doing a, a live stream and they said, what are the main differences uh, when you lead a remote team? And I wish I'd remembered this one, which is you become sometimes, well, someone else can do it. But I think I think as, a, as an ecosystem uh, person, as, as the guardian of the ecosystem, it's about looking at, at that. And if we've got lots of channels open in, in Teams or Slack, or if we've got lots of Trello boards, I don't care, then it is is this still fit for a purpose or are we just letting piles and piles of paper, the equivalent of piles and piles of paper gather in the office uh, with everything that that uh, throws, you know, psychologically seeing that also. So I think it's really important. And I like that he said, okay, we're now just going to have seven channels in our team. That's, that's, that's interesting because, um, Th- that should also be a conversation sometimes. Uh, a friend of mine has opened a Slack for um, for the time of the lockdown and she was saying, oh, should I open this? You know, is there anyone up for me opening this other channel to discuss this other thing? Great question. <laughs> we didn't have to ask those questions in the office before, but now maybe we do, maybe. Yes, and if maybe you can design that at the start if you're going through a transformation or you're planning to shift everything into a tool or maybe, you know, you have to let it, grow and sprawl and then iterate on that, um, tidy it up. Does Slack have sort of nested folders and things yet? I can't remember which ones do and which ones don't. Nested folders? So can you have channels within channels? No, no, no. I don't think so. That was used to stress me out with (laughs) Slack. That was why I moved Blocksparks to Twist originally. So you could have folders and sort of have, you know, by you could have client as the top level and then projects for each client within that and so on. So you can at least collapse things out of sight um, rather than scrolling through all these channels, uh, all the ones that you don't even know are there. You see, it's nothing, it's no accounting for taste. Channels within channels. (laughs) (laughs) Great. But this is just really, like you say, uh, whether you plan it or whether you organically go with it, it needs reviewing. Uh, and yeah. this is, again, something that, that is forgotten about. So I think that's, I mean, the, the, it's really interesting. The conversation about tech always has to come back to what we need as a team. And every we either look for a tool that will help us, we either look for a process that's going to help us, and we might need to change our behavior around a process or a tool we already have. So it's really not just about the tech. Uh, and again, I was having another conversation with someone that they were saying, well, instead of searching for apps for remote work, 
Actually, I think it was uh, Brie from Shield Geo was saying that maybe instead of searching for apps for remote work, we can search for apps that do this specific thing that we need. And then we start to really grab the technology that we need and not just what other people are using. Um, and, and to get to really understand the tools we've got, I mean, I'm not saying understand everything, for example, that teams can do if you're in the Microsoft system, because that's not your job, probably, to know everything. I don't, there's probably no one at Microsoft knows yes. anything teams yes. can do. But, but to know what's new, what's coming down the pipe, like this article um, that we'll put the link to, which had the updates that we talked about, you know, there is... There's so much investment going into these tools and platforms at the moment and useful new bits of functionality that might be transformational for you. If you have someone who needs the closed captions, for example, you know, it's, you can just update and turn this stuff on and it, it's all there. Um, also, the stuff about voice activation that, that's come out in Teams now and being able to turn meetings on and off just with, with your voice is going to be so important when people do go into co-located meeting spaces again and don't want to touch stuff. Yes. Um, so there's all this stuff going on. So it is important to to keep up with it a little bit just to see what how you can get the most out of it. Yes. So that's more or less what we think is got well, what's caught our eye in the world of work or what's coming through our uh, uh through our systems. <laughs> so uh, let's let's just have a look at our our little virtual not distant community and contacts and see what's new there. So this is, uh, well, it's, it's not going to be a very long section, listeners. And I have to say that I would love to hear if you have anything that you would like to share with other listeners. <laughs> so any articles that you've seen or anything that you've heard in the episode or indeed in other episodes, or indeed, like we heard in the first section, anything that you think we can help you amplify. We're, we're here for you, virtualnotdistant.com. Or if you want to just send an email to me, Pilar, P-I-L-A-R, at virtualnotdistant.com. And Maya, to be honest, I don't have a lot to, to share about uh, what's going on with our, our connections, but Minds at Work are doing something really interesting. So long-time listeners might remember them from, I don't know, mid-2020. They turned up to talk about their first online event that they were having, and or maybe it was, was it before that? No, it was during the pandemic. Or, no, I think it It might have been even 2019. Yes, yeah. that's right. It was September 2019. Okay, well. What has happened to I time? Know. Well, you have to be a very loyal listener then. Um, so what happened, of course, uh, Minds at Work, they were doing all their uh, events, mainly in the UK, in person. And uh, this was just one that they did on uh, well-being and remote work and now they've of course done all their um, events online and they were thinking what is one thing that what can we offer what can we what's really good practical help that we can offer mainly they're focusing now on business leaders and actually uh, SME uh, business leaders and it's really interesting it's an event um, well it's an event no it's a it's a it's not a course, it's a program. <laughs> it's a hive, highly interactive virtual experience, which is going to be hosted on Remo, the online space for where you can have s uh, small group discussions really easily while still seeing what else is going on in the space. And it's really about um, find, giving uh, leaders a focus uh, on mental health. So I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> well, well, I will and, and, and start reading. So what's happening in the hive now? This is something that's happening January to March 2021. So if you're interested, and it's only UK because of the way it's funded for now, um, you can follow the link in the show notes and find out more. The, but this is interesting as what's happening also in the broader sense. Founders and C-suite leaders from small and medium-sized businesses will meet fortnightly to lay the foundations of good mental health. In the face of pandemic and unprecedented challenges for SMEs, we will thrive by taking care of ourselves and our people. We will emerge with life-changing habits in four domains, sleep, nutrition, exercise and relaxation. I think this is wonderful, even if you're not going to take part. <laughs> Just looking at that says a lot. Yeah, it's great to know that it exists. And I also really like the fact they're focusing on the SME space because I think that's 
uh, that can end up underserved. There's lots of stuff aimed at sort of entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, and there's sort of big organizations that we tend to work with, whereas people who are trying to do everything in the middle of that can be under incredible pressure. Um, and I, I, I like the the peer model as well, um, the fact that they're not going to necessarily be too prescriptive, but people are going to support each other. And I could imagine that some of those interactions will go on past the 90 days and create something really supportive. Yeah, that's really at the heart of what they want to do. They want the peer support element with um, with a psychologist or a facilitator really looking after the, the group to provide that safe environment, mainly at the beginning, actually, but really for the group to take ownership of the program. So wonderful stuff. Minds at work. Check out, um, check out what they're doing in addition to that. Then, well, and then I suppose what's going on with Virtual Not Distant, we're still Hammering for podcasting for connection, which goes uh, again, which is really about addressing this fear that uh, uh, senior leaders have in organizations that their people are going to feel disconnected from each other. And I think we already talked at the end of last year that teams have sorted this out to, to some degree. But now is what do we do about the organization staying connected? So we and, and and more and more, and I was so pleased to see um, that LinkedIn post mentioning audio only because it's a recognition of all the senses. Um, of course, we're mindful that there are people who will struggle with audio. Uh, so there's how do we also use the podcasting for connection in a way that doesn't leave anyone out. Um, I think from a mixture of medium <laughs> for everything yes. is the answer. Oh. We do need everything, and it's exactly the same as in the co-located space. You know, you would have a mixture of phone calls or face-to-face -face meetings or, or whatever, and in, in the remote space, we can choose um, the blend of communications that we use. And, it, yeah, it's, I think the focus on audio is often a very good way of getting people to really pay attention to the words rather than the distractions, and there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Also, the idea of the podcasting for connection ties back to this stuff from Minds at Work, that it's very much a mutual peer-driven thing rather than something hierarchical, a way for organizations and individuals within that to really connect with each other. And I hope that's going to be an important theme for the year ahead. Yeah, exactly. So this is really uh, for, for those listeners that maybe have joined us just for this episode or who've forgotten what we're talking about, because let's face it, we're not at the center of the universe. Uh, this is uh, taking our love for podcasting into organizations. It's helping uh, probably, I suppose, who would work with us directly. I imagine internal communications, HR, maybe learning and development. Um, it's about finding, okay, who are the five or six people in your company that could really make the most of this as a as a project, as an internal cross-functional project and helping them drive an internal podcast created for the people of your organizations by the people of your organization. And I think what's really exciting me about this is that in order to do that, we need for a beginning a facilitator. So facilitation to help the group decide what is this or consult other people on, okay, what are the things we're missing? What are those interactions in the physical space that we're missing? And how do we bring those into the company? Or from a higher level, maybe what are some of the values that we think might get lost? Uh, and we, where are the stories that reflect those values? What are people learning that they can share with others to make it a, a stronger community? And then through the concepts of visible teamwork, get that show together. So I think it, it starts to tie everything, everything in. Uh, and then, yes, it's a very simple idea. But like Maya was saying, this is not this is not a marketing thing. So this is not for the outside world. This is not a top-down approach. Those are fine, but that's different. That's not what we want to do. It's really about finding the voice of the people in the organization and giving them a different channel, which is an audio channel that you can, I'm going to say the word consume away from the computer. So listeners, we're still in the very early uh, stages. So we love to work with people at the early stages. So if uh, you have an organization and you think this might be useful, let's, let's talk. Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. 
So, Maya, with that plug, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have to have a plug. plug. Uh, well, we hope you, you've enjoyed the show. I, I have to really once more uh, thank uh, Francisco for getting in touch regarding uh, Guatemala, the, what's going on in Guatemala and reminding us that not everyone has a, a space to be able to work from home. We've looked at the tech. We've looked at a lot in the end, Maya. <laughs> we've, we've looked at the tech with some reminders that we need to the tech is there for us. We've looked at hurrah, asynchronous has become mainstream. And then, uh, yes, anything else that uh, you want to share before we go into the stock outro, Maya? No, I think just wishing everybody everything that they hope to gain from 2021. It was last year was an interesting ride, but hopefully this year will be more consolidated and sustainable and productive. But we'll be with you all along the way. <laughs> Thank you for listening. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Orti, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.